So with that being said, my guest today is Annie Blake. Hi, Annie. Hi, how are you? Oh, I am just fine. Good. And I have you on with me today. Thank you. You're welcome. Good, good. So let's get started. Now, let me tell my listening audience how I got to um, be introduced to Annie. Now, I have seen her around for years and didn't quite know that we had a, a, a person in common. Her sister and I used to work together, and we have um, similar likes in terms of she was a dancer and, and I used to be a dancer, and we ended up at the same company. She was in charge of the fitness um, center. And last night we ended up at the same table at a at a social function and sat there all night long. And then as I, as um, we were leaving, she whispered to me, are you still doing your radio show? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, my sister would be great. <laughs> I said, your sister? She's your sister? Yes. And then she told me about all the things that Annie knows, and I'm just excited about hearing about that. And the person I'm talking about is Edith. Edith Randolph, um, and I had the pleasure of having her as a part of my book signing because uh, my book on African Americans of Tampa, the, the cover, has a picture of Majorette, and Edith was a head Majorette, and she came with her baton, <laughs> and that was a delight for the evening. So I'm just um, excited about hearing what Annie has to say and um, letting us know about some of those sibling things that happen as you grew up as well. So tell me about um, your beginnings. And, well, you said you came to Tampa um, as eight years old so or eight or nine years old. So tell us about where did you, where were you born and um, how did you get to Tampa? Well, I was born in Monticello, Florida, and um, my parents had moved to Tampa. I was left with my grandparents. And after they came to Tampa, well, they sent, they got settled, so they sent for me, and I was nine when I got here. So from there, you know, I've been here ever since. Oh, all right. So what was, now, do you remember anything about Monticello? Well, you know, we got the courthouse in the middle of the, <laughs> right in the middle of the road. <laughs> You have to drive around the courthouse to get to the next side, other side. Oh goodness! And well, uh, we are on the, the the courthouse is on the Buffalo Nickel. And um, well, we lived out in the country, so you know we had to get to town. During that time, we we had to walk wherever we went most of the time. So you know it wasn't that we got to town often. <laughs> And it wasn't much of a town anyway at that point. Now, but, what do you mean by that? Because when I say that, being from the backwoods of Georgia, um, at the time that I grew up, there was one stoplight <laughs> in the entire city. And now they've bypassed that. <laughs> they've taken a I see oh. all the way around my little town. But it's still there. But you won't Well, know they've it. added you know? high, um, you know, street lights and stuff in the city. But, you know, it's still that rural area out there. Uh, uh, my sister and I went up for a family reunion, and she said, Oh, thank God, Mother, and move away from here because I sure couldn't stay here. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I couldn't live here. I would have to leave because it's just too country. <laughs> oh, see, now, that disappoints me. I thought Edith and I had a lot in common. Edith, we just took a departure because I love the country. But she wasn't born in the country, see. She oh, was born here. Oh, so she okay. So not know anything about the country. Yeah, it is something when 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 you live in the city. Like I, I have a friend right now that that was born and raised in the city, and they don't have any concept of what putting your foot in dirt is all about. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But, yeah, she wasn't, you know, she didn't live here. I mean, she was born here, and she didn't get a chance to, you know, to really know what the country was like until she visited. But see, when when I was there, I mean, we, you know, everything we ate just about we bought. I mean, we grew, mm -hmm. you know. 
And like the corn, we took the corn, they, or our grandparents took the corn in town to get the meal and the grits, you know, get it ground. We made our own syrup. We grew our own vegetables. I mean, you know, we didn't have anything, but we was rich with whatever we had. We didn't want for anything, you know. And, uh, it's funny to hear you say a couple of things that you just said because when you said we were rich, there's a poem called the Me Nobody. I mean, there's a play called the Me Nobody Knows, and in the middle of the play, um, there's a line that says, "And all the while I was quite happy," meaning that until somebody told them that they were poor, they had no idea, and they were quite happy. But in our case, um, you know, growing up in the in the in in a rural area, you have so much there, and you don't want for anything, so you are not poor, no matter how much money you have coming in, because if you can feed yourself, you're doing all right. You know? Absolutely. We, do that. we absolutely could do that, you know. So Yeah, and, and, you know, we had, I mean, oranges and tangerines, pecans, you know, whatever we have here, we had it there, but it was grown, homegrown, so it was even more healthier than the foods of vegetables now. Yeah, I can totally relate. We grew up with um, 12 pecan trees around my house, and so mm-hmm. we always had pecans, and um, I grew up, you know, picking peas and okra and um, beans and all kinds of stuff. Right. And, and, and then, you know, when, when they had that hurricane a long time ago, and people in Alabama were so distraught because their electricity was off for, for a long period of time and their freezers <laughs> went bad. And a lot of people didn't understand why that was so devastating. It's because we've had a freezer on our back, um, a deep freezer on our back porch and would um, put vegetables and meat and enough to last the whole year in those things. And so for the electricity to go off, you're talking about some serious food being gone. Yeah, I know. But see, well, when it was like hog killing time or stuff like that, they had a smokehouse. We had a smokehouse where they smoked the meat and stuff, and the meat would last forever, it looked like. You know, and at hog killing time, they would cure that meat, you know, and, and, and we'd sit out by the fire, roast sweet potatoes and do cracklings and all that kind of stuff. And then they, when they cured the meat, you know, they cured the meat in the smokehouse and they preserved it that way. And, of course, we didn't have any refrigeration or no electricity. We had lamps and what have you. And I remember when we got ice, it was like that was a a, a commodity. That was a good commodity then, you know. And then they, like, bury the, dig a hole and bury the, the ice in the ground so it was wouldn't melt so fast. <laughs> it wow. was really experience, so. but I enjoyed it, and I didn't know what, you know, coming to the city, it was like you got to get totally used to that. You know, it's a whole different world. Uh-huh. But don't come to the city so quick because, see, you're talking about things that I, I'm familiar with, but mm-hmm. I haven't heard anybody else talk about it in a long time. Like when you were talking about the, the ice, what that brought back for me is the the fact that there's a spot on Highway 21 in Georgia headed up to up in the country where I grew up. Mm-hmm. And as you turn from one part of the road to another, leaving Springfield going into the, the highway, the old highway, there's a spot that used to have uh, an ice house. And every Mm -hmm. time I go by there, there's nothing but woods right there now. I think it's overgrown. If there's any structure there, it's it's totally not useful anymore. But I can't remember anything but overgrown brush. But what I when I go past that spot, it's almost like a a memory um, that just pops up. I I always remember the ice house, and I had it had to have been functional just as I was, you know, able to remember anything because I don't remember actually getting ice or anything like that. Just remember seeing the ice house. And right. It, it wasn't there long before it was gone. But I mm. remember seeing it, you know. And, yeah. And, and when you say bury it in the ground, now that's something, um, even in Florida, 
it was the ground was cold enough to hold the ice like that. Tell me more about that. Monticello is in North Florida, uh-huh. and you know, even being out in you know in the the, the rural area, you know, it, it it wasn't as warm because it stayed colder out in the rural area than it did in the city. Because in the city you usually have houses and stuff that blocks the cold. But when you're in the country, you know, you just have the trees and stuff around you. And, and like I say, that was North Florida. So they had a way of doing it, you know. And uh, the the grandparents, they, they took care of what they had to take care of. Now, I don't know how long it lasts because then I was still young, quite young. But uh, I do remember, you know, some of the things that, you know, we did. And then it's like, you know, our parents, the grandparents would go, uh, they would go picking water, uh, getting watermelons, picking peas and all that stuff. But they wouldn't let me go. But I had to stay home because my aunts had children, and I stayed home and babysit. (laughs) So I didn't have to do that. I was babysitting at an early age. So, you know, it's like you got to grow up real fast. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, and, say, you say grow up real fast, but it's still such a protected environment, so it doesn't feel as as fast as what I feel like these kids have to grow up today. Um, oh, no, no, you know, no. Our growing up was growing up to be functional, physically functional. Absolutely. Physical, you know, but to, but to know so much and to be exposed to so much, that was not necessarily what I remember. You know, mm-hmm. what these kids are growing up with is un, unreal. Yeah, well, you had to, you know, you had to do what they tell you to do, you know, and I mean, if you didn't do it, you know what was coming, <laughs> you know. It's not like now H- uh, HRS say you can't spank your child, and you know, like the Bible said, the spare the rod, uh, spoil the child. You can't do that. We couldn't do that, you know. We had to mind our parents. We had to do what they said. Plus, we wasn't in, around a whole lot of stuff, and one house was like my, a couple of miles or so from the next house. So you knew you had to do whatever your parents say do, or else you got it. I remember the, my grandmother, I did something. I don't remember what I did, but she put me between her legs and tore my butt up with a switch. And I never will forget that. And so, you know, y- you learn how to respect people, you know, and that follows you, you know, wherever you go, because they didn't play. You know, the parents now don't have any parenting skills like our parents, our parents and grandparents had. They don't have those skills, and and they could look at you, and you 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 had you knew what was coming, so mm-hmm. you did and, the right and, thing. And that whole thing about it takes a village to uh, raise a child, well, when that statement came out, it was almost resentful because it's like, oh, yeah, we know this. <laughs> we grew up with this. You sound like that's something new because, um, you know, there's somebody that came to my house one day and made the mistake of stopping to Miss Ada's house to ask for direction. Mm-hmm. And it was a boy. <laughs> <laughs> and actually he happened to be a light-skinned um, black kid, all right, so and I have to tell you this because, I mean, I have to say that in order for you to understand the story. So he found the house. He came unannounced. I was devastated. I mean, nobody had come to my house before. It was like, oh, my God. And then for him to stop at Miss Ada's house, that was worse. Mm. And um, by the time he sat down, Miss Ada was knocking on the door. Miss Steve, I just wanted to see what white boy that was I was sending down here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, so yeah, hey, they say it was nosy. They characterized him as being nosy, but, you know, being nosy paid off. It did. It did. Now, he was not white, but nevertheless, she didn't know it. <laughs> mm, she was going to make sure she knew. She was going to make sure. And and that was perfectly allowed, you know? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, now the other thing, when you were talking about digging in the ground for the ice, what that reminded me of was um, the fact that we had sweet potato banks, and when sweet potatoes that were in season, we would harvest them, 
and then dig a hole and put straw in the ground. Mm-hmm. And I put potatoes on top of it and put straw on top of the potatoes again and then put dirt on top of that. And those potatoes would stay fresh all year long. Yeah. They year had around. They had their means. And, mm-hmm. and you know, you, you, then you don't know what's going, what's happening. And then, you know, after a while, I would say, well, we had this all year round. Now, why we can't have them, you know, some things that we can't have now, we don't have. They are seasonal. And even sweet potatoes. Like, if you put sweet potatoes in a refrigerator right now, they will be Mm -hmm. in in a month. I am interviewing Annie Blake and having an absolute ball talking to Annie. (laughs) Um, We haven't even left the country yet. Now, she has had a life of growing up in the country or at least being born in a rural area and then moving to the city, but we're still in the country. Um, now, Annie, <laughs> tell us more about or if you have any stories about some things in the country, and then you can tell us about how you got to Tampa. Well, um, I, I was like, you know, when our parents was out doing the farming, and I was home babysitting. I didn't start the school until I was eight. So, you know, that put me far behind the kids in, in town now. And when I did go to school, we was in this little one-room, uh, you know, the, the one-room schoolhouse where all the classes was in the same place. And I remember my teacher was Pauline Broxton. And uh, we had to walk from my homes to the school, and I, I'm i not a good judge of miles, especially as I was that young, uh, how far it was, but I know we got out there and walked. We walked to school and back to school, back home because we didn't have any cars then. We was just, you know, we had to do what we had to do. And um, I remember my grandmother, she would cook, uh, and my grandmother dipped snuff, so one day she we finished eating. She said, uh, I'm going to get me a dip of snuff. And she said, you want one? And I said, yeah. Lord, I got some of that snuff, and you talking about sick? <laughs> I got so sick and was vomiting everywhere. I said, oh, I don't ever want no more of that stuff in my life. <laughs> That, but we had a good time, and, and, and she would cook, and we, you know, we just had plenty of everything. Wow. And uh, my brother was there, and, and uh, we just enjoyed the country, not knowing anything about the city. Mm-hmm. And and um, when you talked about snuff and trying it, that's the experience I had with trying a cigarette once before. When I was real little, um, I got my hands on a cigarette, and I went behind the pecan tree, and I tried it, and I coughed and gagged, and, oh, it was just awful. And then (laughs) (laughs) I had the task of trying to sneak them back in the house. And on the way back in, going through the dining room, Grandmama and somebody was sitting in there, right, maybe Granddaddy, and I dropped those cigarettes. Oh, my God. Oh, you got it. Grandma went, she grew up and said, what is it you got there? And I don't remember a thing else because I went into a shock. Um, and I think I was so panic-stricken, she didn't even have the heart to spank me. But, <laughs> but you never did that again. No, I sure didn't. Mm-mm. And they, they'll scare the daylights out of you. They didn't have to oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, scare yeah. you to death. Like, the fear. <laughs> they put that fear of God in you. <laughs> mm-hmm. And <sighs> with the the switch, Grandma had a way of um you know, if she if she wasn't really I shouldn't say angry, but if it wasn't really serious, she'd have um the switch with all the leaves and stuff on it. But mm-hmm. then when it got serious, she'd strip that thing bare. <laughs> oh I, yeah. I was in trouble. But, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, there are some people right now that don't believe in spanking, don't believe in giving a good whipping. But to be honest with you, I am very, very, very torn about that. Now, personally, I've only spanked one of my children once, okay, mm-hmm. and and that was enough to get control. 
but I would not, I don't regret having done that because it was needed at the time and it worked. That's right. But when you when you compare it to the fact that we're not allowed to do that or not it's not something that you're supposed to do today, the alternative is is if if the parents are not allowed to spank and to get control of the children, then the next thing you know you, know, you have an eight year old being handcuffed and dragged away by the police, and and, and they whooping them, and they whipping them, yeah, and right. beating them down. Um, yes, so right. If a policeman can beat a child down to the ground, why can't I at least punish? And now the the rule of thumb that my grandmother used, so so you can be clear about what I'm talking about. Grandmother always said you should never hit a child when you're angry because right. you don't know your own strength. Absolutely. So it wasn't about beating a child. It was about punishing and getting their attention. Yeah. And you know, so I I really am quite torn about what I hear, and I understand how complex an issue it is, but I'd rather a parent with some parenting skills deal with the discipline than the police. Absolutely. You know, and then sometimes they would tell you, I don't have time to whoop you now, but I'm going to whoop you later. <laughs> you know, you just remember you got a whooping coming. So, that you know, worse than the women. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you had to wait on that whooping, honey. Mhm. And that might be an example of exactly what grandma was talking about. They may have been so angry at that moment they knew good and well that they had no business spanking you then. So, wait right. a minute. Wait a minute. We're going to get to this. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So. So um, tell me about Tampa, because I know there are a number of people out there that know that you know a lot about Tampa, especially the Central Avenue area. Now, for my listening audience, I just published a book called African Americans of Tampa, um, published through Arcadia Publishing, and I'm so happy with it. I mean, it's, I, it, I'm absolutely thrilled, and, and especially the response that I'm getting. Um, even the Florida Sentinel listed it as the, the one of the gifts to get. It was one of two books that they recommended that you buy as a Christmas gift this year, so I am real thrilled about that. And and having gone through this project, I've learned a lot about Tampa, and I've learned to totally respect the, the culture of Tampa, the history of Tampa, and I look forward to continuing gathering information. So I don't want to go too much further without you start talking about Tampa. Speaking with Annie Blake, and we've been talking about living in the country, growing up, and all of the wonderful memories that that, that goes along with that. Um, now, because I know she's from the Tampa Bay area, I want to hear more about Tampa because I've just written a book called African Americans of Tampa and have become totally fascinated with the, the history of Tampa and its culture. So um, tell me what you remember about the early days of Tampa. Oh, the early days was, um, well, my parents was living on Constant Street, and we was living in one of those shotgun houses. And actually, we were living on the waterfront before the waterfront got popular. When the Hillsborough River overflowed, it flowed up in our yard. So that's how close we were to being, you know, on the waterfront, where they pay mega bucks now to live Mm -hmm. and um but it was like you know when it rained real hard and the river would overflow and you know the sewage was going into the river and everything else but you had to live with it and of course we was near downtown we was like in very close walking distance to downtown it didn't take us 15 minutes or so to get to town and um, so when I came to Tampa, my mom immediately started me, put me to work. She had me going and ordering groceries at nine years old. I couldn't believe it, but I did what I had to do, <laughs> whatever she told me to do. And uh, Daddy had a T-Mall Ford uh, car, and uh, it was great to see a car, you know, just to ride in a car because we had never, I mean, we had seen them, but we didn't have one, so... It was like heaven riding in a car. I remember that car. And, of course, um, we had to still walk everywhere we wanted to go. We was in walking distance. 
and it was a close knit community at that point. Uh, everybody knew everybody, and if you did something wrong, it was like having a telephone, uh, you know, just like we have now, uh, cell phones. Because when you got home, if you did something wrong, when you got home, your parents knew about it. And, and you know, like they say, that took that village to raise that child, they did it. And you had to abide by it, and, uh, you know, you had to suffer the consequences, whatever it might be. And, of course, um, I going to school, I went to Dunbar Elementary, and uh, then from there I, uh, I went to Carver. And, of course, at Carver I did play basketball. And, um, you know, it was a rivalry between Carver Junior High, and we had junior high schools then, between Carver Junior High and Booker T. Washington Junior High. And, you know, it was fun, you know, doing that. And we also went to St. Petersburg, nearby cities, playing basketball. And that was really uh, interesting. And, and and we enjoyed doing that. And then the boys and girls team, we they would have charter buses to take us. And, and we would just enjoy it, you know. And it was something that we got away from the city. Uh, our city and went to another city, not city but town, and so um, it was real interesting. And then uh, I left when I graduated from Carver. I graduated with top honors, and I was the best all around girl. I don't know how I got to be that, but <laughs> it it worked. <laughs> That's what they said. Uh, they gave well, me a. Five hey, dollars. Your piece of history. That is a fact. It is a historic moment for you and this city because you were all around. All right. So we accept that. <laughs> and they gave me a five dollars for that, and for having the high scholastic average, they gave me ten dollars. So you know that was plenty of money back then. And then I left. I after graduating from junior high school, I started to Middleton, and of course I was one of them little fast girls. I got pregnant. And dropped out of school, and I had my son. And uh, so after that, it was like, what are you going to do? And so I uh, did domestic housework for a long time. Then I got tired of doing that. So I said, you know, I need to do something else because I messed up my chances of going to college. And so um, I went to beauty school. We had a beauty school here. Uh, Sunlight Beauty School, and it was ran by Mr. and Mrs. Robeson. And uh, so I enrolled there, and I didn't have any money, but I would work after school. I worked in Shelly Green Restaurant as a waitress to suffice to take care of my son and myself, although we were staying with my parents, you know, but, you know, you had to do something. You couldn't just sit around and not do nothing. And I was not comfortable not having a means of uh, living except doing domestic work because I had my experiences with that. And uh, the last uh, job I think I had was domestic work. I was working for this lady, her husband. uh, He owned Tampa Radio Sales downtown. And one day we were sitting down talking and... uh, when you went to the house, you had to go to the back door. So we were eating lunch one day, and, and somehow the conversation came up, well, you know, segregation and, and all that. So I told, I said, Miss Pemberton, I said, you know, I said, it's mighty interesting that you all don't want us to sit by you on the bus or a plane or whatever. I said, but we come into your homes. We clean your house, we wash your clothes, we cook your food. How much closer can we get to you? If we wanted to do something, you know, to you, if uh, if we was that contagious, then, you know, you couldn't get any closer. And she told me, she said, you know, I never thought of it that way. You know, she said, you really opened my eyes to, you know, a lot of things. I say, and we raise your children. You know, how much more can we do? 
You know, and you don't want to sit by me on the bus. I don't care about you sitting sitting next to you anyway. I just want to get where I'm going. It didn't matter. So after that, she had a different uh, outlook on racial uh, tension, racial uh, items, I guess you would call it. And so I, when I finished working for her, because I started off at day's work and then I went to every day, and so um, she had her daughter was in school and her daughter's friend was living. They were teachers. And they would pass me down their clothes. Girl, I was sharp all my life mm-hmm. after that. <laughs> they would pass me down those clothes, and those clothes was like, everybody said, ooh, where you get that from? I said, ooh, oh, off my jaw. <laughs> but it was, you know, you, you, you got to have things, even though uh, it was hard, and day's work was hard, and I just said, okay, I'm tired of this. I'm going to do something else. And then I found out about Sunlight Beauty School, so I enrolled there. And I didn't have all the money. It was hard paying that because then I had to take care of my child. And like I said, I went to work as a waitress in Shirley Green's restaurant. And then I got to know a lot of people and a lot about that. But even coming up after uh, when we got a certain age, we had a recreation center. It was Kid Mason's Recreation Center. And on Saturdays, they would have a dance for the teenagers. So we would go, and I had to beg to go, and Mama said, be home by 11. Well, the dancing turned out to 11, and I was always late getting home because then we had to go and stop by, walk down Central Avenue because it was off of Central Avenue, but we had to walk down Central Avenue and go to this place called Cozy Corner, and they had hot dogs with chili sauce and fried chicken and chili and uh, it was just so good, and you just had to get it. And, of course, I had to wait for somebody to walk with me to go home. But it was Cozy Corner, and it was owned by uh, Roosevelt and David, and I can't remember their last names, but it was the best old chicken and hot dogs and red rice with giblets. And they put some sauce over it. Ooh, you're talking about living? That stuff was good. And it was, you know... We knew everything. We walked up and down Central, and we couldn't go into bars and stuff, but we would always peep in and and try to see what was going on. And, of course, then we um, our black policemen came into force, and they were walked the beat, as you say. And uh, you get to know everybody. And at that time... Uh, after I graduated from uh, beauty school, I started working uh, at Lovey's Beauty Shop. It was formerly Singleton's Beauty Shop. And then you got to know everybody. You knew what was going on, when and where. And, of course, all the singers and the, the gospel singers and the blues singers and all came to town, and you were able to interact with them personally because they had to stay at the Pyramid Hotel because they couldn't go in the other hotels. And we had the Afro Hotel and then uh, Rogers Hotel. And they had to stay either of those places. But most of them stayed at the Pyramid Hotel because it was in it was down on the, the, the beat, the drag, you know, where everybody was in, in the restaurants. We had our own restaurants and stuff. And... Um, they would come, the singers and stuff would come in the beauty shop. Sometimes they'd get their hair done or the guys would come in and talk. We met everybody. It's not like now you can't get close to an entertainer now, but at that time, you, I mean, you just interact with them all the time. I mean, they would come in and you knew them. And the last dance I remember going to was I can Tina Turner at the Apollo Theater, which was upstairs over a building. It was an old building, and we'd be dancing and the floor be shaking but we were having a good time. It was up over a bar called the State Moon. And, um, but we had the patio, too, that we would go to dances, and we also had the armory that we entertained us. Jane Brown would come to town, man, we would, you know, and you could take your food and your liquor or whatever you drink, and you just had a bowl. 
I mean, we just had a good time. We didn't have no fussing and fight. We might have an argument, but people wasn't as as vicious or violent as now as they were then, not in my eyesight anyway, because, you know, back then you either, they either cut you or pull potash on you. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. And um, so it was wonderful. And then we had um, two theaters. We had the Central Theater yes. Yes. and the Lincoln here, Theater. Uh, hold on one second about the uh, the – the Lincoln Theater, just hold that thought. But when you said the the two ways that people fought back then was either they would cut you or throw potash on you, mm-hmm. um, that reminded me of when we were in high school. There was We heard of this kid who threw potash on a white person. Really? And, yeah, now, see, your reaction is exactly what happened back then. We could not believe that that boy did that and lived. He went to jail. But he uh-huh. lived. He lived, and that was just astounding to us back then, because that was just we just knew he was this person who was somewhat in our age range, just a little bit older. We just knew he was dead. Yeah. Um, they, but he went to jail and and actually got out, and that was a that was a moment for us. I'm telling you, that was that was a defining mm-hmm. moment to know yeah. that because you know. It was just terrible then. I mean, the way they treated us sometimes, you know, we we couldn't do anything. And then when we go downtown, there were stores that we couldn't even go in. And uh, finally, in theaters downtown, and I was one of the first ones to go to the first integrated uh, movies, and that was a palace theater. But the funny thing about it, I had been working cleaning the palace theater. And then that was the first theater that let blacks come in, so they had a select group of people that they came. And we, I never will forget that picture, how the West was worn. And we went to, <laughs> we went to see that picture, and, um, you know, that was the beginning of the integration of the movie theater. When was that? I don't know. Um I don't know. I don't know what year it was because I was... I never, you know, even, it was half, it had to be in the 60s. Okay. It had to be in the 60s. Because, wow. yeah, I came out of beauty school in 59. Mm-hmm. I graduated from beauty school in 59. And, um, oh, well, yeah, it had in the early 60s. 60s. Yeah, the yeah. early 60s. Um, and lot, so, uh, what happened in Tampa in between 1965 with the Voter Rights Act and all of that, um, and 1967, especially as it relates to the Jim Hammond story, I learned a lot about Tampa in that time frame and how how impactful that year was. But go ahead, um, you were talking about um, the experience of of going to the movie. Yeah, going to the movies. We went to the movie. We used um, soda water tops. And a lot of people don't remember the Central Theater, but I remember vividly. And they had rats running over the place because it was... <laughs> but we went anyway because that was the way, that was our entertainment. And, of course, then, you know, they didn't have uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, we We knew rats. We had rat traps and stuff like that. But, you know... You didn't, and I don't even remember roaches at that point, Uh, but I remember rats. And uh, because I know they were in the theater, when we would go to the theater and somebody had a rat, and everybody would get crazy, (laughs) start looking. But it was like, and then going to the Lincoln Theater after, I think they closed the the Central Theater because it got real raggedy. And then they had a theater in West Tampa called the Carver Theater. And then the Lincoln Theater was where most of us went. We did go to the Carver Theater, but then it was like boundaries. You know, we had boundaries then, uh, West Tampa and um, Belmont Heights. You know, they had territory. You weren't allowed in, in different territories if if uh, you didn't know somebody. And, you know, it was like they would fight you, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. 
That was your ground, your territory. But then when you got to Central Avenue, which was centrally located, nobody bothered anybody. But if you go in Belmont Hike or West Tampa or something, you might get a fight. But that now, was it. Hold on to that thought. You know what you just said that 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 I have never heard anybody say, but it, it's it's interesting. I've heard about the um, the territorial West Tampa versus East Tampa and 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 what have you. But the fact that Central Avenue was a neutral ground that that even the name um, is appropriate when when you realize that that happened. Right. Wow. Because we all went to the same theaters and we all went to the same movies. I mean, uh, the recreation center, we went there to dance. We all up and down Central Avenue together. And they had, um, like, uh, MacArthur Studio. And on Easter, man, it was like they had an Easter parade. And everybody from everywhere was there. You know, they dress up and they go take their pictures at MacArthur's and and we just paraded up and down Central just showing off our little Easter stuff. Mm-hmm. And it was a neutral ground for all the areas from Belmont Heights to West Tampa, you know, to Central Tampa. And and we didn't have any problems. It just was not that. If you go into that area, then you might have problems. But as long as you was on Central you, uh, in that central area, you didn't have any problem. And it well, was just... Go ahead. Uh, it was just good. And, you know, we had our restaurants and stuff. And, um, like, Roger's Dining Room was one of our, our update restaurants. And then we had... Well, I worked in Shelly Green's, and it was popular, and Johnny Gray's. And, you know, we had another other little... Uh, restaurants down there and we had the Cotton Club which uh, Mr. Joyner on Gene and, and Henry Joyner and uh, I when I started working I met Arthenia and started doing her hair when she was in junior high school up until I still do her hair now and she's the senate our senator our state senator and um, it was like, you know, during the time when we we went downtown, we had our own, you know, they, we had the colored water fountains and the white water fountains, and you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. And you couldn't sit down and eat. If you got anything, you had to take it out. And that was when all the, the civil rights movement came in and all that started. And then President Kennedy came in and, um, uh, you know, it was it was exciting and everybody was you know, like, Oh, President Kennedy in town and you know, and we just had a good time. I mean, we had fun, good clean fun back then. And like I say, we just did but you didn't do you couldn't be caught drunk or nothing like that. You know, you couldn't if you drunk you had to hide it. it, it 'cause our parents didn't tolerate that. They did not tolerate that. And then if if somebody saw you, they was going to go back and tell them. So you just had to, you know, do right. And when we would go to the recreation center, a lady named name is Jenkins. If you dance too close, she come and put her hands between you. Okay, move back. You're dancing too close. It was so funny. <laughs> Yeah, we had one of those in our school, too. They would literally walk up to you and put their hands between the two of you and part you. And that was that was embarrassing. Not for me. I, did, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't have them. Embarrassing for us either. We just laugh at it. And then as soon as she turned her back, we go back to doing the same thing again. But that was her job, and she did it. She was a little short lady, too, but she didn't care. She was a little person, but she was she carried some, a lot of weight. And boy, you didn't you didn't disrespect her. You did not do that. And so, you know, you went there, and and she would bar you from it if you got disrespectful. You couldn't come in. Mm-hmm. Now, you, you know, could. one of the things that I'm I'm being made aware of because of the book that I've written, mm-hmm. um, especially when I was pulling it together, a lot of people are confused, especially people that are not African-American. And some African-Americans that did not experience what we grew up with, 
they are confused about why we wanted to have integration and why we wanted certain things. It was for equality, but not necessarily to lose our culture. There is when you you know people hearing you say that we had a good time, we had fun. There, there, they may be confused about that, but African American culture and the society was delightful. It was Absolutely. what happened when we got outside and had to interact with other people that were treating you unfairly and caused a, a degree of anger to, you, you know, to bubble up because, you know, you, you, you're treated like a human being when you're among your own, you know. Right, and, and then, you know. Whatever. And then you get out and all of a sudden you're not even human, you know. So, Absolutely. So that, that caused a lot of confusion for some people to realize that there was a subculture, as they may call it, that was quite content with what we were doing. It's just when we got outside and couldn't and and re- weren't allowed to be um, treated fairly. So all they saw was the anger, but that's not what we saw growing up. No, but the thing it was is that we we didn't even have equal access to the things that the whites had access to. You know, even our textbooks and stuff. You know. And, and you know, the thing about it, when we left elementary school, we could read, write, and do arithmetic. Now they go all the way to college and can't do it. And our, wow. te- our teachers made sure that we got our lesson. And, you know, and, and we knew it. And we had to know it or else, you know. But we weren't treated equally because we didn't have equal access to what they had. So they were ahead of us in a sense. And that's what was disturbing because we couldn't we wanted we 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 love our neighborhoods, but we wanted to be able to do the things that everybody else did. And that's just like I say, we couldn't even go in certain stores downtown. And it's not because we didn't have the money, but we weren't allowed to go in it. And that was, you know, that's what was the problem. They would not give us equal access to what they had, you know, and it it, it it really it was just not fair. And and now we don't have any neighborhoods. Yeah, I know. It's, we don't have any neighborhoods. They've even taken that away from us. And it's just like now they are trying to take Harbor City. They are taking West Tampa, the North Louisville homes and stuff. And I understand that they do need replacing. But it's like when they replace us, they put stuff in that we it we lose our identity because they take everything that we grew up with away from us. So we don't, you know, we don't have anything to interact and say, you know, I did this here and there, you know. Now, because I was on Constant Street. Uh, I lived on Constant Street. Now they done changed Constance to Fortune. Oh, really? You know, it's like everything that we could identify with, they take it away from us. Now it's it's kind of ironic that you use that as an example, though, because from from me who did not grow up there, um, that to me is a pos- a positive thing because Fortune was a black person. And, yes. And, and so they've actually extended the name further down, apparently, than what it was. But you know I, I, I thought Constant was a black person. Yeah, I don't know, they, maybe yeah. I got him confused. Huh? No, you might be right. I'm not. I'm not certain. In fact, I was going to ask what was Constant named for. Um, and it could Constant could have been a, a person's name, or it could be who knows. But we, I do know that Fortune was. Um, mm-hmm. What I understand was a, a, a woman, and, right? Um, they they took that, and then apparently they're replacing some of it. Yeah, they have replaced it. You know, because where we live, when I say like on the waterfront, where place one is, mm-hmm. I was we was living right there in that area. 
So you see okay. how close no. to downtown it was. Believe it you or know, not, we're and gonna have to do, we're going to have to do a part two with this. <laughs> um, we're close to the end of the show, and I, the, we, if you got one minute that you want to say one final thing about um, the experience of growing up, then do so, and then we need to wrap it up. Well, I enjoyed it because we had good, clean fun, and everybody knew everybody, and as now we don't, I don't even know people anymore, a lot of people, unless I knew them from the day. And I've been in the public. public. I, I, huh? Go ahead. And I've been a hairdresser for 54 years. And, of course, you know, I know a lot of people, period. But now I don't, you know, I don't know people that come to town anymore because we don't have that closeness that we had and we don't have the areas mm -hmm. and I know some of the areas were blighted areas and they need re restoring but they were they when they restored them they just took them away from us and wow. and so I I um I miss that I miss the camaraderie that we had with each other mm -hmm. you know where well, we looked out for each other and and I I totally understand the feeling and maybe this is the beginning of a conversation where um, just the awareness of how wonderful it was as a social event or social environment 